Greetings. Welcome to Conversation with the Geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, and today we have Leon Yatcher, Professor of Geography at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven. And Leon is going to discuss some of his reflections on geography and, and how he became enchanted with this field and a little bit about his, his own life. First, Leon, <clears throat> tell us all, really, how did you become absorbed with the geographic discipline? Was there somebody that uh, captivated you in your studies? First of all, thank you for having me here, uh, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, you're asking a very interesting question, which has been asked of me many times, and until uh, I would say the last couple of years, I haven't really thought about it. And the way uh, I think I can answer you is that seeds were planted very early in my life without my knowing it. Uh, my father uh, went through a period of time, about my, maybe five or six years, uh, in Peru where I was born, uh, in which he traveled throughout the entire country and took me with, with him. And I think that I was exposed to virtually every corner of Peru. We even crossed the border to neighboring countries. So at a very early age, I already knew about international borders, however loosely they may have been at that time. And I didn't understand that aspect of it. But certainly, uh, in, in reflection, uh, it seems to me that my father played an important role in uh, introducing me to many places that were very, very different from each other. Peru has a coastal area, a mountain chain called the Andes, and then the uh, tropical rainforest of the Amazon. And so, you know, when you're eight, nine years old and you're exposed to that, you, you cannot help but notice the, the differences of just those landscapes, never mind the uh, cultural differences uh, within the country. Tremendous differences, uh, you know, the Quechua Indians, the Aymara Indians, and then you have uh, a combination of so many other factors that makes the country quite, quite an interesting country. When you're that young, you don't truly absorb and understand that, but the seeds were planted. Um, so then uh, opportunities uh, presented themselves in which I uh, was able to migrate to the United States, and eventually I found myself uh, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Uh, where I transferred from Norwalk Community College in Connecticut, where I uh, uh, received and took my uh, associate's degree. And at New Mexico, I was uh, literally uh, <coughs> expected to choose a major uh, upon arrival. I had no idea what to choose. And to make the story a little shorter, uh, I found myself taking a course uh, called Introduction to Geography taught by Richard Murphy, who, uh, as he walked into the class and began to lecture, I think it took me the better part of 30 seconds to decide that geography was uh, uh, my chosen discipline. And frankly, I haven't looked since. Uh, I haven't looked back since, and I've had the opportunity to not only proceed with uh, geography uh, and got the appropriate degrees, the credentials, and uh, I am now at Southern uh, in New Haven, as you mentioned earlier, and my career there has been uh, overall very positive. I have no, no complaints to speak of, and I've traveled uh, worldwide. Uh, the research that I do is divided into four different categories of which uh, I have published in each and, uh, and I've been very, very fortunate. And I let, think that gives you part of what you're looking. Let, let, let's go back to New Mexico yes. with, with, with Richard Murphy. Richard Murphy was, is the father of Alec Murphy. That's correct. Uh, um, yeah, distinguished professor at the University of Oregon. That's right. Very well-known geographer. Yes. A luminary today, one might say, in oh, many yeah. ways. Um, I mean, and so here, his father was at the University of New Mexico and essentially sparked this interest that said, hey, this is somebody I want to emulate. Oh, is there yeah. anything that you could, you, you could bring to our attention that was so fascinating about Richard Murphy, the geographer, that, that, that captured your interest? Well, uh, frankly, he was just a 
great lecturer, um, and he, he just knew how to deliver the material. And, and whether the seed of geography was dormant within me and he essentially watered it, or uh, he was the reason, it's, it's hard for me to say. Uh, but there were distinct aspects about him that, uh, that really contributed to my desire to, to continue. As a matter of fact, you mentioned Alec Murphy a few minutes ago, and the fact is that there was a time in which, without having met him, I was rather upset that Alec was uh, Richard Murphy's son. And I'll tell you part of the reason why. Uh, there was one semester in which uh, Richard Murphy was granted a sabbatical, and I didn't know what the word sabbatical meant. I had no idea. Now, of course, I do. I haven't had four of them myself in my <coughs> career. And so, uh, you know, when I began to ask, what does this sabbatical mean? Uh, and I was, it was explained to me, in fact, Richard Murphy explained it to me, that he was going to Hokkaido, the North Island of uh, Japan, uh, to be there for a year, and on the way back, he was going to uh, cross to Vladivostok in the Soviet Union and drive across the country to Paris and eventually back to the U.S. And I picked up on the word eventually. I, I wanted to know what that meant because uh, I took every course that Richard Murphy ever taught, and uh, the learning process was simply uh, cumulative. Uh, and very positive for me. So for him to be gone one semester and my not having the opportunity to take a course, it just uh, upset me to no end. I remember walking on the campus saying, why? Not fully understanding the process. I find that humorous today, of course, but at the time, <laughs> it, it was pretty serious for me. I was, of course, a lot this younger. This guy has a lot of gall to leave me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I saw, and then when I discovered that he had three children, he was taking them to Japan with him, I said, what, you know, who are these kids, <laughs> you know? They're generally my age group, and so, I, I mean, how lucky can they possibly be? And, of course, I learned about their names, and eventually uh, I, I got to know Alec. Uh, I like to think that I liked to, I met Alec, and got to know him pretty well, and uh, we reminisce about this. In fact, I interviewed not only Alec, but I also interviewed uh, his mother before she mm -hmm. passed uh, mm -hmm. away. Uh, and uh, in fact, I went to Oregon to interview her uh, and uh, trying to put together a paper that I'm still hoping to complete uh, and, and get published about Richard Murphy. Uh, and the angle would be Richard Murphy, the mentor, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, so, so really, this sabbatical experience opened my eyes to a world of academia that I had not known before. And so uh, I, I, it, at that time, it didn't occur to me I would ever end up being a professor, much mm -hmm. less be uh, honored with uh, sabbaticals. And so, uh, the, the language formation that Richard Murphy provided was beyond the geography classroom. It was really an introduction to what academia is about, and, and uh, that was very, very helpful to me. Um, and, and I think uh, it has uh, proven to be very positive at the end. So as you reflect upon your, your life in academe, and you have been fortunate to conduct research during, during uh, various times of sabbaticals, various experiences. You have engaged in, in research in a variety of areas. You are perhaps one of the most eclectic, if not the most eclectic geographer that is active in academe today. Um, Harm de Blay is another one who is extremely devoted to conducting field work and has a broad expanse of knowledge of the various aspects of the discipline. Yeah. But yet you have trekked in perhaps almost as many cities as the late Larry Ford, who stepped foot in 
in perhaps more world cities than any human that's ever lived. What sorts of information might you be able to gather just by, just by walking in, in a city? Can you give us an example from a geographical perspective? What happens in your question is that it truly is a very breadth-oriented question. Uh, as I walk the streets of any city that I've been to, I look for commonalities between cities and differences between cities. When you start walking down the street with those questions in mind, two questions at the same time, really the city opens up for you. Uh, metaphorically speaking, the city starts talking to you. And in reality, uh, I do not go to a city without talking to the people that live in the city. As a matter of fact, I make a point of usually staying in places that most um, tourists would not think of staying. Uh, I rarely stay in the hotels. I usually stay in a uh, local B&B or uh, or a uh, rent an apartment, especially since I usually make it a point of visiting cities long term, not for three days at a time. Uh, and so uh, I, I, don't, I don't gather superficial information as I walk along. Um, and, and, and one of the things that has happened in my career as I've matured in geography is that I've also become very aware of the literature that is complementary to what we do in geography. So I read uh, the planning uh, 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 literature, I read sociology, and I, I certainly don't avoid anthropology and some other social sciences. And they each, with their perspective, provides me with the clues that I will need to create what I hope is a more holistic understanding of a city, which then uh, uh, it opens up um, uh, details that you would ordinarily not uh, get. And so, um, and I don't look at it the same way as someone like Larry Ford, who you mentioned a few minutes ago, does. Um, and so, and, and then of the cities that I've traveled, I've concentrated in two regions in the world, Central Asia as well as uh, Latin America with the emphasis of the Andean countries. Uh, and so, the, the kind of information that I really do extract is the kind of information that when uh, you try to put together a project that you want to publish, uh, it, it, create, it, it brings together many of the literature angles that have been previously reported, but then you add the angle that often the literature misses. Uh, that, that is the angle of how a person in the middle of the city of Havana, for example, uh, views his or her city. So in a sense, you are synthesizing the works of, of other students of the social sciences, mm -hmm. and by developing an intimate relationship with the city itself, you're able to really grasp the the topophilia that a resident experiences, that affinity for the place. Right. I like to think that that's what I obtain and that's what I do get out of those visits. And often I'm not sure how successful I've been. Uh, and it's not for me to say that, it is for those people who read what I have written to, to, uh, to bring forth whether I've been successful or not. Uh, so, so yes, I tried to do that. And, and I gotta tell you, uh, part of my motive in doing that is because it also gives me a greater understanding of myself in, in terms of how I negotiate these uh, cityscapes uh, and how I negotiate other parts of, uh, of the country that I'm visiting at a given time um, because uh, being that I was born in Latin America, but I've spent most of my adult life here in the U.S., and again, I've been fortunate to travel uh, quite widely, uh, you know, I, it, I never stop finding 
another aha moment, you know, a moment in which you know you, you think that you've traveled in over 150 countries and you've seen it all, and you know that you haven't seen that much. It just looks that way because every unique uh, site provides you with uh, its own personality, its own characteristic, its own uh, reason for being. The more you learn, the more questions you have. Aristotle said that, didn't he? <laughs> did he? Yes, he did. <laughs> I think that's true. All I true. know is that I know nothing. For the more I learn, the more I... The more I learn, I know the, the less, less I, I know. know. Exactly. Absolutely. That's, those are his words. Oh, you, you, have, you have done this work in Central Asia and in Latin America. You've done work in migration early on in your academic career. That's right. And um, you've done work with various ethnic groups ranging from African Americans in New Haven to those uh, many ethnic groups that occupy today Central Asian countries. Oh, yes. Uh, but but you are very well known now as a as a, a delegate from the United States to the International Geographical Union Commission devoted to the history of geographic thought. Yes, and you have done quite a bit of work in the history of geography. I said applies to Latin America. And, and, uh, and, and frankly, at this moment, <coughs> I'm probably the only one that is doing so in the United States regularly. There are others that tend to touch once in a while and so on, but consistently, I am the one who's doing it. And I've, uh, I've, I've, I've done uh, a, a lot of work on the issue, as you just mentioned. The, the main problem has is, is been that it takes a very long time because it's a puzzle that you're putting together uh, from primary sources, archival collections in various parts of sometimes our country. My latest project is on Moises Bartoni from Paraguay, uh, not known really as a geographer, but I will do my absolute best to show his geographic contributions and add geography to his forte. Um, to, to accomplish the work of uh, Bartoni, it's taken me the better part of 10 years. And, uh, and visiting not only Paraguay on multiple occasions, but also neighboring countries where Bertoni has uh, done work. Now, he was born in Switzerland, and so uh, a visit to Switzerland, of course, was uh, imperative in order to look particularly at his early life and uh, even to, uh, to visit the school that he uh, was, uh, was formed. Uh, this kind of work is, is very, very slow and, and very, very, uh, uh, some people would call it very tedious because you have to literally read every document that is available as you discover archival collections. And, and so um, uh, the, this is one of those things that discourages a lot of people from pursuing this kind of work. But for some reason, it hasn't discouraged me. Uh, if anything, uh, I've done work on other geographers of Latin America. Your and work I chose on Latin, and I, yeah, Henry PT in PTA. Costa Rica. Your, your, your book born. on PTA was right. well received. Yes, and several articles that I published around uh, the book, complementing the book, uh, published in Costa Rica and Switzerland and some other places. Let's, let's, let's talk about PTA just for a moment mm. because this, this was a significant contribution to the history of geographic thought in Latin America. And here is an individual that most American geographers have not heard of. What attracted you to study this guy named PTA? What, what, what was it that captivated you about him? Well, I discovered PTA uh, at the end of another project about a man called Antonio Raimondi mm -hmm. del Aqua, an Italian-born <coughs> geographer that spent Thank God. all of his li uh, life, professional life, adult life in Peru. And when I finished that particular research project, then I had literally uh, mailed the manuscript uh, to eventually get published, uh, I was in need for a new project. 
And coincidentally, at the time, I was flying back from Peru to the United States with a stopover in Costa Rica. And so in Costa Rica, when I landed in Costa Rica, I, I, at that time, the airlines would allow you to change your ticket, no cost, to stay as long as possible. And the Costa Rican airlines at that time allowed you to stay in Costa Rica as long as you wanted, uh, at, again, at no extra cost. So I changed my ticket to stay in Costa Rica three or four days. Uh, and then I immediately went to the University of Costa Rica and approached uh, colleagues of ours uh, at, uh, at the UCR. And I asked uh, one of them about who would be the most important geographer that gave birth and or uh, provided geography to the country. His reaction was, well, Henry Pitier, of course. And that, that was the birth of the Pitier project. My goal at the time was to hopefully be fortunate enough to collect enough information to write another article such as the one I did for Raimondi. Uh, fortunately for me, this uh, initial thought of uh, writing an article kept growing and growing and growing to the point in which it not only yielded a book, but it also yielded several articles that were published, as I mentioned to you before, in several uh, countries. And uh, I'm working now uh, on yet another article about Pitié and his contributions to anthropology. And I have already an outline about his contributions to climatology. Uh, but Bertoni is the one that I'm working on now at this moment. So, so really, Pitié, uh, the appeal of Pitié was uh, not only because I needed a new project, but also uh, the amount of primary sources he left behind was simply enormous. And no one had looked at it before. And no one really was doing any kind of work about important geographers in Costa Rica, much less uh, Latin America at that time, which is largely true today. And the people in Costa Rica were just so excited. And they all knew about PTA, but they didn't know about the details about PTA. They had a lot of anecdotes, and there were a lot of newspaper-sized articles that were published in newspapers about what people thought his life was, and often not necessarily re relying on actual documentation. PTA, by the time I completed it, my work with him, took me to 55 different archives in more than 15 countries. Wow. And, uh, and I, and I got to tell you, it was truly chasing detail and finding detail and discovering things that people had taken for granted about him that were either not true or were different in result. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and PT really in my mind had four lives. He started in Switzerland, went to Costa Rica, and after Costa Rica he came to the United States for several years, about 14 years. And he uh, did not uh, warm up to the U.S., mainly because of the, as he called, frigid winters. Being Swiss, I found that to be a contradiction, mm -hmm. um, especially in the part of Switzerland he came from. He came from a town called Bex, um, not far from the uh, French border. Uh, and, so, uh, and so he moved to uh, uh, Venezuela, where he was for 33 years uh, when he died in 1950. And so uh, in those 33 years, he did for Venezuela what no one had done before. And in fact, the Venezuelans have asked me consistently to do a book about his years in Venezuela. And I have not done it because of several reasons. One of them is that by the time he got to Venezuela, his geographic orientation had decreased. He became more of a true botanist. I'm and more so, familiar with his biogeographical work. Right. So. In Costa Rica, he did excellent geography, including mm -hmm. biogeography. He mentored several people there. By the time he left the United States and went to Venezuela, he had uh, changed uh, his, uh, his uh, career, not by choice. Uh, I have correspondence when he was already in his 80s uh, saying that he, he his major regret is not doing his geographical studies, that he had to do the botanical studies. Now, 
Uh, there were many reasons why. Uh, one of them is that Venezuela at the time was looking for a botanist, was looking to create an herbarium, mm -hmm. a collection, and so on. And so, and he wanted to emigrate from the U.S. because of the frigid winters, as he would say. In the years that he spent living in the United States, he only spent one winter here. The rest of the time, during our winter time, he was in the tropics. So he, he, he this one winter is when he caught pneumonia and never fully recovered from it. Hmm. And lived with it for the rest of his life. And that was not uh, something that he enjoyed very much, and I can imagine why. So uh, in Venezuela, he did a, 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 I mean, a tremendous amount of work, and he also mentored many botanists who, who some of them mentored many of the faculties that exist at the universities in Venezuela who are essentially intellectual grandchildren of PTA. Uh, the, the man was just simply enormous. It's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's very striking and it's important that this work, this work is done. And I, I think of the work that's done in North America devoted to the history of geography and I recall one of the items that has, <coughs> has uh, that, that really struck me but nearly 30 years ago, I think, and, and has remained with me since, and that's your uh, piece on Erwin Royce. Oh, yes. That was my first uh, attempt to essentially recreate the professional lives of geographers, yes. And, and here is, is this immigrant who meets with uh, success in the United States in some ways and, and finds himself confronting uh, great difficulties in another. Can you talk about Erwin Royce? Because to me, the story is fascinating. Well, yeah, uh, you know, Erwin Royce was uh, a, a very gifted uh, geographer, cartographer, uh, came from Hungary, never really captured the English language very well. He was not known for being a great lecturer, and he was at Harvard for many years. And, uh, but what he was really well known for was his ability to create lectures on the blackboard and with chalk just literally redraw what he had seen in the landscape. So his drawings were uh, his map drawings were simply phenomenal. And uh, there's uh, correspondence that I saw note taking uh, that the people in the maintenance department at Harvard who would come in to clean the rooms and empty the garbage and so on, uh, always felt very guilty of erasing the blackboard because the works of art were just outside the realm of normalcy. Um, and, and Royce uh, migrated to the United States, uh, never quite uh, learned the English language, as I mentioned before. And yet, he was, in my mind, and I'm very much in the minority, uh, that feels that he probably is the single most important force that created cartography as a discipline or subdiscipline of geography uh, during his time. Uh, and, and he uh, wrote uh, several books, including General Cartography which if anyone who wants to be a cartographer wants to get a sense of the value of cartography, let's say 50 to 80 years ago, they must see uh, the book that uh, uh, Royce wrote. Um, and and uh, this is a man that uh, not only wrote very well and, and widely, he also introduced new techniques. He was the, you know, one of the earliest proponents of using thematic maps and including uh, uh, the use of cartograms, for example, or proportional circles and so on. There were others as well. You know, Arthur Robinson, for example, uh, is, a, is another uh, great figure. In fact, often Arthur Robinson is considered as the father of American cartography. And, and yet, uh, I, I feel very strongly that uh, Royce should be certainly by his side um, although, personally, I think that Royce probably should be considered uh, the, uh, the father of American cartography. Again, I'm in a minority in that uh, respect. Uh, Royce, unlike Robinson, did not mentor students. And so 
part of the value of one's career is who you mentor and how many. Arthur Robinson has a large number of students that have mm -hmm. been guided and mentored by him. And he was in a very large uh, department in the United States, here in the Midwest, and received tremendous amount of support uh, to make the program not only viable, but extremely successful. And he surrounded himself with some very gifted colleagues. Royce was, in many ways, uh, alone. And he did not have the support that uh, it's, it's really necessary. And he did not have the number of students that people would, would, would uh, consider uh, as the students who would guide yet mm -hmm. another generation. But, but his skill was remarkable. Didn't he, didn't he look out airplane windows and draft maps by hand? Well, the story, uh, well, yeah, yeah. The, the story that I always go back to is the problem that he had while he was uh, mapping Cuba. He was assigned to, to uh, map the island of Cuba. And he had a problem. And the problem was daylight. He, you know, he needed daylight to do that, which was fine. But the problem was that uh, he would uh, uh, start uh, before the sun would rise, and the plane, the pilot would just sweep the country uh, north to south. And outside the window, he would be looking outside the window. Royce would be looking outside the window and literally drawing the country as he was flying. He would be hand drawing, hand -drawing. topographic maps. Yes, sir. And they still exist today. I mean, you can see them widely in many books as well as loose leaf maps. But then the pilots, after two, three, four hours of this intense flying, uh, would get tired and wanted to get down. And well, Royce wouldn't put up with it because he says, this is daylight. We, we are losing precious time. You can rest at night. Well, Royce pushed the right buttons, and he got three different pilots and three different airplanes to fly and take up the entire time that there was daylight. <laughs> then the curious thing is at the end of the day, he would literally go back to his room and edit the maps from memory that he had drawn that day. Uh, his uh, you know, talking about somebody who has, uh, you know, photographic memory, this is probably an example of that. Now, I never physically met uh, Royce, but I did meet his son, mm -hmm. who described a lot of what we're talking about. His son would sit by Royce, by his father, and observe how the father would put together. The son chose a different profession. He became a medical doctor uh, at the University of Connecticut Health uh, uh, Program. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, Irwin would, if I may call him by his first name, I, I, you know, Irwin Royce, uh, he would then, again, in his room, under often dim conditions, because the lights were not always the top quality lights in the room that he was staying at, he would, he would literally look at his day work and edit at details of landforms that he would have missed. And then he would do a follow-up checkup the next morning to be sure he was right. So the first cycle of the flight in the morning was to retrace the previous sorties. And to check his work from his additions. That's exactly. And Amazing. Then, and, then and I have seen some of those originals in which he would, on occasion, admit to a mistake by putting a X <laughs> and then draw with a blue pen, right, which does not show when you photograph. And then he would put a little note redrawing the landform. Amazing. I tell you what truly is amazing, since you use that word, the number of landforms that he would fix was very small. It's not like he would make 100 mistakes. He would make four or five mistakes. And when he would redraw the final form, it really was the right landform, just maybe the angle of incidence was wrong or <laughs> the, the talent. De definitely one of the most amazing figures in the history of geography in North America, 
perhaps one of the most unsung yeah. heroes. My students yes. have used his topographic map of North America, California right. part, yeah. for field trips in California. Oh, yeah. and, and, and they're enchanted by yeah. the topographic character that's illustrated in that's these right. maps. Leon, in the last few minutes that are, that are remaining, yes. I'd like to talk briefly about some of the work you're doing in Central Asia, especially with regard to journalism in these post-Soviet countries. Would you, would you share f with us for a few moments so, some of the things that you've learned, some of the things that, that, that you'd like to share with us? Um, one of several uh, angles of research that I've done, and, and uh, Michael, I don't know why, but I keep choosing topics that nobody else wants to do. <laughs> you know, when I do Latin America, right. nobody else is doing it. Uh, the same thing with other work that I've done, some of which you've mentioned and others. The, the Central Asia is yet another one. I'm one of the very few geographers that has consistently uh, looked at Central Asia as an opportunity to study, uh, particularly after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. Uh, the Central Asian region during Soviet times was close to foreigners. Uh, you could not easily uh, travel. Today, it's a vast difference. There's still some problems in having access to, let's say, Turkmenistan, which I've been to. Uh, but the, the fact that no one really is doing it in any, any consistent basis draws me to Central Asia, and I've published quite a few things about it. And one of the latest uh, research projects uh, entails the role of journalism um, in the region. And the area that I have concentrated the most in is Kyrgyzstan. Because Kyrgyzstan, uh, of all the Central Asian former Soviet republics, is the one that is attempting to attain uh, democracy as you and I define it here in the West, as opposed to the other countries that are still struggling with that issue. Uh, and, and, and so what's happened with, with Kyrgyzstan and Central Asian journalism, what I noticed very early uh, in my travels there, and the first time I went to Central Asia was 2003, when I was able to obtain a uh, Fulbright uh, professorship there. Uh, and I, I noticed the, the transition process from a totalitarian uh, <coughs> political unit, such as the Soviet Union, where they control every aspect of the media. They are the media, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, to a more Western model, uh, such as that of the United States, in which we in the United States think of the media differently than the rest of the world, and some of them are catching up to us. We think of the media as being a watch, watchdog, watchdog uh, media, that is essentially uh, making sure that government is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and the media is to report to us their successes as well as their failings. And so uh, Kyrgyzstan wanted to go through that whole process. So, what, what caught my attention was that particular process of change from a totalitarian to a watchdog process. From essentially an uh, organ that is devoted to, almost entirely to generating propaganda. That's correct. To one that is the watchdog. And you're looking at this transitional phase? That's right. I've been concentrating in doing that. Now, uh, and I'm doing this work with a colleague of mine who's an anthropologist and uh, a journalist. Uh, I'm not necessarily in that order in terms of the, his career. And uh, uh, Professor Manzella, also from Southern Connecticut, is the colleague I'm referring to. Um, what, what He's we, done other work in, in, in this area as well as... Oh, yes. uh, we, we did a, a, a chapter different for... Different groups in alternative communities. Oh, I yeah, think. yeah. He's doing a lot of wonderful Very work. Very well and, known. Yes, yes. He's, uh, he's getting a lot of attention out there. And he's also doing things that virtually no one else is doing, and certainly not from an anthropological perspective. Uh, good work. Uh, really is. So the, the idea was, when I, when I, knowing his background mm -hmm. in journalism, he and I started talking about this, and we came up with uh, an understanding of where uh, Kyrgyzstan does no longer, no longer fits mm -hmm. in the model of uh, journalism schemas. 
And what happened was that since we couldn't find any fitting uh, label for Kyrgyzstan, we began to look at countries like Kyrgyzstan that would fall under the transitional mm -hmm. schema that we introduced in an article that we published, uh, in which we're looking at, a, a, at countries that, are, that have been practicing a certain kind of journalism and then now are either experimenting or moving towards a different model. And uh, countries like Indonesia, for example, uh, Venezuela, and uh, also uh, the Republic of South Africa. Uh, and so Kyrgyzstan, though they're not all similar, they're all going through a transitional process. Mm -hmm. The question is what will happen eventually? Will they reach the goal of being a watchdog, or are they going to retreat to a totalitarian? Or what expedites or will they stay? the process? Oh, yeah, yeah, or that's right. And so the work that I've done in- Democracy, in, in, if you will. That's right. Yeah. The work that I've done in uh, Kyrgyzstan has involved uh, not only interviewing journalists and people who read the media, but also evaluate uh, the work that uh, organizations like Reporters Without Borders have published on mm -hmm. the issue and looking at their evaluation. And so uh, that is part of the process uh, that I'm looking at and uh, the, the geographic and fortunately the anthropologic view that Manzella brings into our project uh, creates once again that holistic approach to mm -hmm getting hopefully some understanding and answers to questions that, that we have uh, together and individually. Uh, and so uh, Kyrgyzstan has become a wonderful model uh, for us to use um, in trying to understand how uh, journalism is changing itself. And of course, as a geographer, I'm interested in how that media affects the cultural landscape of the Absolutely. country. And so suddenly I'm finding myself evaluating the, the issues uh, that affect the cultural geography of not only Kyrgyzstan, but also the problems that Kyrgyzstan faces between the northern region and the southern region of the country, which have had their difficulties, certainly after the Soviet collapse, uh, though it existed beforehand too. The Soviets just never reported on it. They kept it again. The idea of keeping, uh, keeping total the control, press in check. total control. Absolutely. The the interesting thing about my interviewing several of the members of the press in uh, Kyrgyzstan has been that in 2003, the position that many of them took at that time was, well, if the government tells us what is the truth, what we got to do is report what the truth is. So when I would bring up questions such as, well, you know, how about censorship if the government doesn't like what you're saying or if the government is not exactly being forthcoming and the questions would be, or the answers would be, the reactions would be like, why would the government not tell us the truth? Of course they're telling us the truth. Well, that created a tremendous amount of discussion, uh, particularly by members of the international community dominated by American journalists mm -hmm. coming to uh, Kyrgyzstan and giving essentially what we call workshops on how it's possible that a politician may not be always interested in telling you the truth. Uh, that sometimes they would make changes, adopt changes, or mm, avoid certain information I that can, could be critical. I can understand how that would be a great contribution oh. to people in, in former uh, Soviet, con so Soviet regions, really, mm -hmm. areas that had been under what we would argue is totalitarian rule. That's right, that's right. I, I, I wish we had more time to talk, Leon. We could talk for hours. Yes, and, yes we could. Uh, we're running out of time, so we'll have to conclude this session uh, of conversation with the geographer. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank You're very you. Kind. Thank you, Michael.